Hey, thanks for joining us here at Faith Online. We hope that you're both challenged and encouraged by today's message. And if you'd like to learn more about who we are as a church and how you can stay connected, head over to faithishere.org right after this video. Amen. How's everybody doing today? Good to see you this morning. Glad you came here with us, especially if you're a guest. Thank you so much for being here. Take your Bibles out again today and turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, and we'll begin with verse number 24. Let's stand together today for the reading of God's Word. Matthew 7 and verse number 24. We have been looking at storms and how we make it through the storms that come our way, and the thing we're learning is everybody goes through them. And whether you like it or not, we're going to have those challenges, those storms that come our way. Our key verse for the series is Matthew 7, and we'll start with verse number 24 today. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams arose, and the wind blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall. Isn't that great news? We sang about the rock, we're reading about the rock, and if your house is on the rock, it will stand. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Let us pray. Father, we love you so much. You are so incredible today. Thank you for your sweet presence here this morning. We pray, God, that as I open up the word of God, you'll open up our hearts to hear what you have for us, and we will give you the praise and glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Turn to someone, tell them, build their house on the rock, and then you may be seated. We're learning all kinds of lessons about how to survive when we go through the storm. Now, last week we were in Acts chapter 27, and uh, we saw Paul, and Paul's out in the middle of the boat. He's in the storm, the, the winds are raging, and the boat's being driven by the wind. And what happens is in the middle of that storm, they try to get out of the boat. They try to get the lifeboats. They think, if I just cut the lifeboats, I can make it to safety. I'm not staying on board the boat. And the apostle Paul says, if you get off, you're going to die. The only way to stay safe is to stay on the boat. And so last week we learned that any way you try to save yourself, to try to earn your salvation, it will not work. It will end in death. But, but if you want to stay in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll make it safely to the other side. Now this week, as we look at this scripture, it may seem like just the opposite. In this occasion, the Lord says, get out of the boat. Peter's on the boat. The disciples are on the boat. Jesus Christ comes walking up on top of the water, on the wind, through the winds and the waves, and and Peter says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. And so he says, come on, get out of the boat. And so a little different analogy this morning, but I believe God wants to challenge us to step out on our faith uh, and get out on the boat uh, and head towards Jesus Christ. And so the analogy is a little bit different this morning, but we've got to get out of the boat and go to where Jesus Christ is. It's a very familiar story. You've heard it before. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, and hold your fingers there to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. And uh, we're going to look at this story this morning when Peter walks on the boat. Now, Peter starts out, as you know the scripture, he starts out walking on the water along and he sees the winds and waves and he begins to sink. So for a while, Peter is walking and then he is sinking. As you look at Peter's life, he is a man of a lot of contradictions, a lot of inconsistencies. You see his life and one moment he's on top and everything is great and he's on top of the world and he's walking and doing fabulously and the, on the, another time you look at Peter and he's sinking, he's blowing it, he's doing something stupid. And I think that's why we like Peter so much because he's like we are. Our life is filled with inconsistencies. Uh, Peter he had what we call foot in the mouth disease It seemed like every time he opened his mouth, he stuck his foot in it. 
and uh, sometimes way in his mouth. And he was impulsive. There were times he could be violent, angry. He would take a sword out, cut somebody's ear off. There were, there were other times he was a coward. I don't even know the man. I don't know who you're talking about. And he denied the Lord with cursing. He struggled with doubt. There were times he struggled with depression. There were times he was filled with prejudice. And you see this all throughout the life of Peter. And then Jesus comes along and he says, Simon, this is Simon. This is the way you used to live. No more I'm going to call you Simon. I'm going to call you Peter or Petros, which means little rock. He says, you're going to be my rock. Now, he names Peter that long before Peter ever lives up to his name. He calls him, you're Simon. From now on, you'll be called Peter, well, he calls them that very early in that three-year ministry he had with Jesus Christ, and yet we never see the real Petros come out. We never see the real Peter comes out till after the Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost. And then you see Peter begin to live up his name, Rock, Rocky. And so on that day of Pentecost, he stands up and he preaches with courage and he says, this same Jesus whom you crucified, he indeed is the Lord of glory. And 3,000 people get saved on that morning. Incredible day. He stands before the Sanhedrin and they tell him to shut up. You can't talk anymore about Jesus Christ. And Peter responds, we can't accept talk about those things we have seen and heard. We can't keep our mouth quiet. We can't stop talking about Jesus Christ. And he becomes a foundation of the early church. He becomes a great apostle. He becomes a great writer and, uh, and, and a powerful, powerful man of God. Peter Petros. I think in our own life, sometimes we act like Simon, we blow it, we fall, we begin to sink, we stick our foot in our mouth, we do stupid things, and sometimes we're like Peter. Oh, we're, we're in church, we're feeling good, we sang all the songs, uh, we're on top of the world, we're winning the battle, and we, kind of like Peter, live that life of inconsistency, and one minute we're walking on top of the water, and the next moment we're sinking, and so we can identify with this man. Uh, but here's the good news, Jesus Christ loves you, whether you're walking on top of the water, or even when you're sinking, Christ still loves you. And he still cares about you, and he will still help you up. And so the message today is, even if you're stumbling along the way, uh, even when you fail, even when you sink, uh, even when you blow it, even when you do something really stupid, don't give up. Don't give up. God loves you, and God will work for you even in the middle of your storm. And so let's look at the scripture together, Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to learn some powerful lessons from this story today. And uh, so let me begin reading with verse number 22. Matthew, uh, excuse me, yeah, Matthew 14 and verse number 22 today. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. And while he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Now, now the first lesson I think we need to understand this morning is this. Just because something is hard doesn't mean it's not from God. I think sometimes we confuse hardness and difficulties with the enemy. It's always the devil's out to get me. The devil made me do it. Uh, you know, it, 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 and, we blame, and we blame God when we go through hard times, and yet sometimes God allows us or sends us right into the middle of the storm to do something in our lives. Storms. Now the reason I share this is because we've already looked at four different kinds of storms. As you study the storms we've looked at and in our own life, Every one of those storms had a different origin. So when you go through a storm, don't always think it's the devil. Don't always think it's God. Don't always think it's because you blow it. It could be any one of those things. The, the one storm we looked at was in Mark chapter 4. Remember when Jesus Christ is out with his disciples? He's asleep on a pillow in the middle of the boat, and the storms rage, and these, these seasoned fishermen think maybe in this moment they might drown. This is the big one. This, this might be it. I believe that storm was a demonic attack. 
And sometimes Satan will come against you and he will buffet you and he will pummel you and he will try to take you out. The reason I think it was a demonic attack is because when they woke Jesus Christ up, the Bible says when he got up, he rebuked the wind and the waves. The same terminology he used when he rebuked demonic spirits in the previous chapter. He rebukes the winds and the waves and says, quiet, peace, be still. The word quiet there means be muzzled. It's almost like you would take a wild animal and put a muzzle upon its mouth. And so he says, be quiet, peace, be still. Now, I believe this was a demonic tact to take Jesus Christ out. And sometimes some of the storms we are up against is an attack from Satan. He's trying to take us out. He's trying to get us to lose faith. He wants us to give up. And so they may be there's times when he will come against us in spiritual warfare. Another storm we looked at the very first week was in Noah's day. The storm that came on the earth in that day was a direct result of the people's disobedience. And sometimes our disobedience, because we don't follow God's word, because we don't obey him, we bring these storms upon ourselves, and, and God has to cleanse the earth again, and so he sends a great flood upon the land. But even in that flood, he's able to rescue Noah and the rest of his family. And so we see there a different origin altogether. And then the storm we looked at last week, Acts chapter 27, the Bible says they went into that storm because the sailors listened to the wrong voices. And sometimes we listen to the wrong voice and the sailors said, now's a good time to go. And the, the, the ship crew said, now we can make it. And the circumstances looked great. It was a calm day. It was a peaceful day. And so they went by circumstances. They went by what everybody else said, but they never sought the will of God. And sometimes if we listen to the wrong voices and we take bad advice and they say, you know what, go ahead and give up on your marriage, go ahead and, and do this, go ahead and do that, and we listen to them and it, and it makes sense at the time and, and we get ourselves into this violent, terrible storm in our life because we're listening to the wrong voices. But this is not the case here. In this story, if you look at the text, it says, and Jesus made them get into the boat and go ahead of them. Now, don't you think Jesus knew a storm was coming out on the water? And yet he still makes his disciples get in the boat and head on across, very well knowing a storm is about to come. And there are sometimes the Lord's will will take you right into the middle of the storm because Jesus wants to accomplish his purposes. I, there's a statement that used to be made, I've heard it before, the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. Well, that sounds like a great statement, the safest place to be is in the center of God's will, but uh, it wasn't exactly the case for the disciples, it was probably the most dangerous place to be. Sometimes the most dangerous place you can be in is right in the middle of God's will. If that were true, ask Jim Elliott, well, you can't ask him now, but Jim Elliott would tell you with four other missionaries who were landed a little small plane in, in Ecuador, how, how the Kichwa Indians uh, put spears in their backs and killed them. Now, were they in God's will or were they not? That was the most dangerous place to be on the face of the earth. And sometimes uh, God's will takes you to places of danger. Uh, sometimes God's will causes us to step out of our comfort zone, uh, out of our living rooms, uh, out of our security, and go reach somebody who's in trouble, someone who's in need, uh, someone who might even be a little bit dangerous in our life, but we're going to take a risk because God is sending us out. And we're going to do what God tells us to do. So it's not always the safest place to be. It's always the best place to be, but not necessarily the safest place to be in the middle of God's will. And so he makes his disciples head right into the wind and the waves. Now, the, the Bible says their boat was being buffeted. That word, by the waves, the word buffeted means clobbered or pummeled or uh, pounded by the waves. They were being buffeted by the waves. Now, here's the challenge for us. When we get out in the middle of the, the, the lake, we get out in the middle of the sea, and, the, and we are being pummeled and pounded by the waves, the tendency is to want to give up. If you're in a marriage today and, and it gets hard, 
Marriage is not always easy. How many know marriage is not easy? Because you got two opposite people, and they totally different backgrounds, and you, and you just don't see anything alike, and, you, and you're out in this marriage, you're on the sea of marriage, and your marriage is being pummeled by the winds and the waves, and, you, and all of a sudden you're out there, and the wind hits you in the face and says, you know, I really don't love you anymore. And the intimacy begins to leave, and there's no more intimacy in the marriage relationship. And the winds and waves are pounding against your marriage. It doesn't mean God is telling you to give up. It doesn't mean I might as well quit and try and start all over again. It happens, and you're out there, and God makes you go through the storm. And you may not like it all the time, but he says, don't give up. If your teenager's driving you crazy, it feels like the wind in your house is blowing against you. You can't give up on them. You can't check out on being a parent. You just have to pray harder and maintain your boundaries uh, and, and, and love them even in the midst of the wind and the waves. And it feels like every time you love them, you get no respect and it's only arguing and fighting and your kids are going nuts and, and you want to give up, but you can't stop being a mom or a dad and you can't stop loving them and you can't stop seeking the Lord for your kids. If your work is hard, and your job's, a, your, your, your job's a jerk. Your boss is a jerk. <laughs> and the waves at your job every day seem to be rocking your boat. It's not necessarily a sign from God for you to quit and move on and do something else. It may be God allowing you to be a, a light in the midst of a very dark environment. And he wants to keep you there and use you there to reach your coworkers and be an example for the kingdom of God. In other words, there are times God sends us into hard places so our light can shine even brighter. God allows storms because God has a big purpose for us. I want you to turn to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. You'll see a very similar story of Jesus Christ walking on the water. Peter is not mentioned here specifically as getting out of the boat, but a very, very similar story beginning with verse number 45. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. While he dismissed the crowd, after leaving them, he went up to the mountainside to pray. And when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on the land. And he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. It was hard. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. And they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Now, this is, this is a very similar story to the one I read to you in our text. And here again, you have Jesus Christ walking on the water. But you have an interesting phrase in there. The Bible is clear. He was about to pass them by. Now, I want you to get this. They're out there rowing for all they're worth. They're not making any time. The waves are rocking the boat. It's very dangerous. The wind's coming against them. They've been out there. They're tired. They've been rowing. And Jesus Christ just comes walking by. Hey, guys. And he passes them up. Right? Walk on by. Walk on by. And he's just walking by. I just read it to you. You thought he was going out to help them. He says, no, I'm having better time than you guys. I'm heading on. You guys hang out here. I got to get to the other side. And he's walking on by. He doesn't even stop. He, he doesn't slow down. Uh, and the disciples are going, they're afraid. First of all, they're scared to death because they don't know who this guy is. They think it's a ghost walking on the water. But something happens as he's beginning to pass by. They, they realize who he is. They cried out. It was in the middle of the storm that the disciples cried out. And sometimes God allows storms to come our way so we'll cry out. Because when it's going smooth, when, when the business is going great, uh, when the money's coming in, uh, when my friends are all around me, sometimes I forget about God. And so God has to make us go out in the middle of the lake in the middle of the storm, why? So he puts us in a position where we will cry out, we'll cry out. 
And it's, it's in the storm. We're tired of rowing and we're worn out and the waves are pummeling us. And finally, we cry out to God. But something happens. Our cry moves the heart of God. And what does God do? He stops. He joins with them on the boat uh, and the seas get calm and immediately they make it to the other side. Storms. Every storm that comes is not a satanic attack. Sometimes God just sends you into the storm so we'll cry out for him. And it's in those times God responds. Now, the second lesson is this. There is this struggle you see going on with Peter, in particular, between convenience and the command of God. Let's pick the story up, verse number 25. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. And Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Just give me the command. Tell me to come. Come, he said. And Peter got out of the boat walked on the water and came towards Jesus. And when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Now, the first thing Jesus says is take courage, it is I. Everybody say that together. It is I. It's a powerful phrase that Jesus Christ uses. It reminds us of a similar phrase when Moses is in the desert. He's been exiled from Egypt. He's run for his life, been keeping sheep for about 40 years now, and he's on the ba- and he sees a bush on fire. And he goes over to where the bush is burning, but it is not being burned up. And the glory of God had consumed that bush, and God begins to speak out of that bush. And he says, go and let my people go. And Moses asked a very good question. Who shall I say is sending me? Well, by what authority am I doing this? And who, how are they going to believe me? And, and who shall I tell them is behind all this? And he makes a statement, tell them the I am is sending you. The word I am is the word Yahweh in the Hebrew. Some people have a, call it Jehovah in, a, in our transliteration. We're not exactly sure the pronunciation, but Yahweh, I am, is sending you. When Jesus Christ walks on the water towards that boat, it is I. He is claiming, I am. uh, I have the same authority of God. I am God, and I am coming to you. He is the Lord who was and who is and who is to come, always the eternal I am God. That's who Jesus Christ is, fully God. I am. I am Coming to you, very similar language, uh, so take courage. It is I. It is the I am God. It is the eternal God, and I'm the one who's coming to you right now. Isn't that good to know who Jesus Christ is? (laughs) Peter says, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come. Just give me the command, and I will obey. Now, Now, listen to me. If I'm Peter, and I'm on the boat, and the waves have been slowing us down, and, and, and the, the, the wind's there pushing against us, and we're not getting anywhere, and life is very hard in that moment. I would probably choose convenience. I probably would have said, Lord, if it's you, tell the wind and waves to be quiet again. Didn't you do that before? You calm the wind, you calm the waves, you rebuked it, and it all went away, and we were fine. And if you'll just calm down the wind and the waves, we will make it to the other side. Kind of reminds me of a lot of my prayers. Hey, God, if if it's really you, get me out of this mess. God, if if it's really you, get me a job. God, if it's really you, send me some money. God, if it's really you, heal my body. God, if it's really you, heal my marriage. God, if it's really you, save my friends. And by the way, it would be great if you did it by Monday. Because it's really hard out here. Really, really hard. Peter doesn't ask for the storm to cease. It's interesting. Doesn't ask for the storm to cease. But he wants to get closer to God. 
He's ready to listen to God's voice. He says, Lord, if you will just speak, if you'll just give me the command, if I can just hear your voice, if I can just get closer to you, I want to challenge you, church, listen to me. When the way gets hard, sometimes we are always looking for that immediate release from our situation, our circumstances, when all the time God is wanting us to get closer to him. God just wants us to get close to him, to learn how to hear his voice. Uh, And so sometimes he allows these storms to come. Uh, If we want God's will to be convenient and we want everything to stop and have peace, uh, and yet many times God just simply wants us to step out in faith and learn to trust him more. We want convenience. He wants obedience. He wants trust. He wants closeness. And the Bible says Peter obeyed the Lord's command and he stepped out. Now, I want to tell you, that's incredible faith. I, I, can, can you believe walking on water? That's amazing stuff. It, 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 only Jesus had ever done that. And he steps out of the boat and his faith is strong. But we read on, he began to walk and he began to sink. Now, there's a tendency sometimes, and we can, we can just bash Peter. He gets bashed a lot, and, uh, of course, we bash him for what he did outside in the courtyard when he denied the Lord, but we also bash Peter for sinking. You know, Peter, you sank. How could you have sunk? Well, his name means rock. Think about it, but uh, not, not just that. You know, we rip Peter for sinking, but, but, but we don't praise him for having enough faith to step out of the boat. That's pretty amazing. I mean, how many of us would have just stepped out of that boat? Peter does it. He is only the second man ever in recorded history to walk on water. Didn't get far, but he walked for a moment. He was on top, the wind and the waves. And yet something happens when Peter is out there walking on the water. The noise of the waves and the wind grew louder than the voice of the Lord, and he began to sink. And this is what happens in our life. Uh, How many times have we set out and we've heard the voice of God uh, and we get excited about serving the Lord, Uh, we step out into a ministry, uh, we step out to do something for God, uh, but all of a sudden the voice of the situation, the voice of the circumstances drowns out that voice we first heard of God and we begin to sink. We start in a ministry. We say, God, I'm going to serve people. I'm going to love people. I'm going to do what you've called me to do. But what happens is people don't love you back. And and they get very critical. And it gets hard. And that wave of opposition comes against you. And all of a sudden, the voices you hear are no longer God's. They're the voices of the opposition coming against you. And that wave of opposition gets greater than the call in our heart and mind, and we quit, and we drop out, and we start to sink. The waves fill the disciples. The the, the world's filled with disciples of people who got out of the boat only to be criticized, only to be talked about, only to be let down, only to be unappreciated, and they're not in church today because their feelings were hurt. How many people, not you guys, are sitting at home right now because somebody offended them in church? Somebody hurt them. Somebody talked about them. Someone gossiped a little bit. And and you try them. And I tried to embrace them and I tried to help them. And they turned it all around and they attacked me and they said things about me. And that's it. If that's ministry, I don't want to do it. And, and, and the world is littered with people who had started out. They heard the voice of God. They were excited about serving the Lord. But someone did something or said something and they, so it got hard and they began to sink. And, and they're, they're not serving the Lord today. They're not in church today. You have a decision to make. Are you going to listen to the voice of convenience? Or are you going to follow the command of the Lord? Are you going to look at the waves and the resistance? 
Or are you going to keep walking towards the voice, walking towards God, going to where he is? Are you going to keep walking or are you going to get wiped out by the circumstances and the opposition and the winds and the waves? Convenience or command? And the third lesson is this. And this is kind of a recurring theme from really all the messages. Storms produce a purpose. There is a purpose in God allowing us to go through storms. And let's pick it up with verse number 30. And it says there, And when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And they break out into a worship service right there out in the middle of the lake. And when they crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret, and when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. Now I want you to put yourself in Peter's position just for one more moment again, if you would. Peter really had no idea what would happen when he stepped out of the boat. No idea. I mean, for all he knew, he could sink and go down. He might walk. Something might happen. But he does it. He obeys the Lord. He steps out of the boat. And I can just picture the rest of the disciples looking at Peter getting out of that boat and oh, there goes crazy Peter again. He's really done it this time. Or there goes that show off. And he's walking on the water, and they're all judging him. They're all critical of them. Let me just give you a little pointer. Don't let those who remain in the boat criticize you for walking on the water because they are doing nothing. They're just sitting there. They're doing nothing for God. They're not involved in ministry, and yet they're going to be very quick to play on back. We all do it all. If he just made that pass right there, I, how could he have missed that? And, and we all play that in church. He has really no idea what is going to happen. But, you know, I wonder if in the back of Peter's mind, he's thinking, if I can just get close enough to Jesus, even if I don't make it all the way, he will save me. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. He got close enough. Even if I sink, the Lord can save me. Verse number 31, look at the word immediately. Immediately, Jesus snatches him up. Listen, if you move out for God, even if you stumble and fall, even if you blow it, uh, uh, God was there to pick you up. Don't give up. As much as we talk about Peter, the central figure in the story is Jesus. This is not a story about Peter. It's a story about Jesus. It's a story about God's grace. It's a story more than just walking on water and rescuing and these kinds of things. This is all a story about the greatness of the grace of Almighty God. God is grace. If you are a child of God, you are going to stumble. You are going to fall. You are going to blow it. You're going to let somebody else down. You're going to say the wrong thing. You're going to do the wrong thing. It's going to happen. It's a part of our discipleship. It's a part of our our growth. We are not fully sanctified yet. That won't happen until Jesus Christ comes back and we all fail. But I am thankful that immediately God is there to pick us up and help us out of the water. Immediately God's grace is able to come through. This story is a story about God's grace and God's power. And that has not changed. And that is the same today, God's grace, God's power. He reaches down, he picks Peter up, he puts his arm around him, and he helps him back into the boat. He says, you're okay, Peter, I'm right here beside you. Let's go ahead and get in this boat together. And he puts them back in the boat. It is all a story about God's incredible, amazing grace. God's grace is greater than our failure. God's grace is greater than our sins. God's grace is greater than our addictions. God's grace is greater than our past. God's grace is greater than our sickness. God's grace is greater than our bankruptcy. God's grace is greater than our divorce. God's grace is greater. God's grace is greater than all the opinions of those who remained on the boats. God's grace picks us up in the storm. 
And it's all part of God's greater purpose. Now I want you to look at the purpose of this storm very specifically. Three things. Let me give them to you quickly. Number one, grace is extended. This, the storm gave God a beautiful opportunity to extend his grace. Grace is extended. Number two, God is glorified. What happens? Immediately they begin to praise the Lord. Truly you are the son of God. This is not about Peter and water walking. It's about a revelation of who God is. Who, the I am God is here. The I am God is walking on the water. The I am God is with you today. And the third purpose is this is all about God's compassion because on the other side, what's he do? He heals all the sick who were brought to him. Listen, even as we go through storms, uh, if we will focus on God's higher purpose in our life, it will pull us through. It brings us to a place in our life where we got to cry out to God. Uh, It also allows us to enter into God's purposes. And so we can extend God's grace to others and they see our life and they see how you're making it and how you're not giving up and how you're loving God and loving people and you can extend grace to others uh, and you can exalt Jesus Christ in your life. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may glorify your heavenly Father who is in heaven. And so when we serve God, we're glorifying Jesus Christ. It also allows us to extend compassion uh, because we can comfort others with the same comfort whereby God has comforted us. That's the purpose of storms. They're going to come. Verse 31, Jesus says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I want to tell you, it seems to me like Peter had amazing faith because he's the one who stepped out of the boat. The reality is he had faith to start, not faith to finish. Real Christ-like, godly faith finishes finishes. The winds and the waves trumped his faith, and he quit. I want to tell you today, that may be your story. You may have stepped out before. You heard the voice of God, but you began looking around. You looked at the opposition. You looked at the waves. You looked around, and all of a sudden, doubt floods your heart. Fear floods your heart, and and it began to close in on you, and you got your eyes off of Christ, and you begin to sink. You quit walking, and you gave up. I want to tell you, keep walking towards his voice. In the storms, you may not always see him. You may not recognize who he is. You may not be able to see him very clearly because the winds and the waves are beating so but you can walk towards the voice of the Lord. Walk towards his voice. And if you waver and if you fall, do exactly what Peter did. God, help me, I'm drowning. And I want to tell you, good news, he is there to pick you up. He'll restore you. He'll bring you back. We need to not only pray for God's protection in the storm, and I think that's the way we pray, or we pray for a release from the storm, but we need to pray for perseverance in the middle of the storm. God, help me not to fail. Help me not to give up. Help me not to quit. Spiritual growth and discipleship includes a lot of falling. It's going to happen. It is a lifelong process. It's a lifelong journey. But I want to tell you, don't let the fear of falling keep you from getting out of the boat and doing something for God. God's voice is calling us to get involved in his kingdom work. God's voice is calling you to some kind of ministry. God's voice is beckoning you to come and draw closer to him. Uh, But don't let those circumstances that are going on in your life, don't let that storm keep you from getting out of the boat. I want to challenge you. Have faith to believe. And trust that God will bring you closer to himself. And if along the way you fall, just cry out to him and he will pick you up. Follow his voice. God has a purpose. Get out of the boat. I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 30 years later, Jesus Christ, I mean, excuse me, Peter writes these words 30 years later. And he says in verse number six, he tells us that very same thing through all the lessons that Peter learned in his life. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief 
and all kinds of trials. Peter just simply says, you know, right now life is tough. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed in you. And Jesus Christ is revealed in your life when you don't give up, when you persevere. Jesus Christ is revealed in your life even when you stumble and fall and he helps you back up out of the water. Uh, but this all, ultimately, all the praise and all the honor and all the glory goes back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and so I want to tell you, listen to his voice. Obey his command. Uh, get out of the boat.